In this hour of Titans, Barry Diller. Barry is a visionary. He is somebody who really, really understands pop culture. He's the media mogul with the Midas touch and the man behind some of Hollywood's biggest hits. From Saturday Night Fever to The Simpsons. There's nothing he likes it so much as to hear that something hadn't been done before. Barry Diller has conquered the big screen, the small screen. There's enormous respect in the industry for Barry Diller. And even the computer screen. You want to fly someplace, you go to Expedia, that's Barry Diller. For Hotel.com, that's Barry Diller. City Search, LendingTree.com, Match.com, that's Barry Diller. I saw this primitive convergence of television sets and computers. I just said, the world is going to change. January 1994, on the back lots of Hollywood and in the boardrooms of Manhattan, two media titans wage a very public war. The bidding war is on. QVC, the home shopping channel that's run by Barry Diller, started what they call a hostile takeover of Paramount. The bidding war with a $9.5 billion offer. In one corner stands Barry Diller, part owner and CEO of cable shopping channel QVC and legendary entertainment executive. In the other, Viacom chief and media tycoon Sumner Redstone. The prize? Paramount Pictures. And for Diller, it's not just business, it's personal. After all, he once ran Paramount as a 30-something wonderkind in the 70s. The perils of Paramount. The war for Paramount, the nation's last It is a drama that's unfolding in Hollywood and on Wall Street right now. This was a tornado of press coverage. It was just every day. It was nonstop. It, it, it was a delicious battle. So this really puts the pressure on Paramount to respond. For four long months, Diller and Redstone try to outmaneuver one another. Sumner Redstone just upped the ante to $10 billion. For the man who shocked Hollywood just two years earlier by stepping down as chairman and CEO of 20th Century Fox to build his own empire, the stakes are high. QVC, as successful as it was, that's not where Barry Diller wanted to be. He wanted to be in the media action, as he was with 20th Century Fox, as he hoped to become again by acquiring Parma. It was his comeback bit. All eyes are on Diller. Can the man who started his career 30 years ago, pushing paper at a talent agency, build a media empire? Barry Diller's story begins just a few hours north of the town that would one day make him famous. February 1942. San Francisco, California. Local contractor Michael Diller and his wife Reva welcomed their second son, Barry. Diller's father builds homes, so at the end of World War II, he moves the family to Los Angeles to take advantage of the post-war housing boom. My family built an awful lot of houses for returning GIs. They didn't want to go to the old homestead wherever it was. I mean, they wanted to move to Southern California. Diller's parents settle the family in Beverly Hills. They lavish their children with a lifestyle filled with privileges others can only dream of. So that's the environment that Barry Diller grew up in. Um, it was a very comfortable life. Uh, the father was tough. He told the sons that they had to be successful. Barry's early academic performance offers no hint of the success he'll achieve in later years. I read a ton. I always read, but the school thing wasn't something I had a particular interest in. I don't think any of us were school geniuses. I don't remember us fretting over our grades at all. Diller strikes up a friendship with neighbor and Hollywood heiress Marlo Thomas. It's a relationship that eventually will shape his career. He just became a part of the family. He was smart, funny, loved to laugh, uh, was you know sarcastic, uh, found the funniness in, in things. Really fit in with our family because we were always screaming, laughing at our table. It's the 1950s, and Marlowe's father, legendary entertainer Danny Thomas, is one of Hollywood's brightest stars and one of young Barry's idols. I was in their house more than I was in my house. 
Danny Thomas was kind of a surrogate father. Young Barry gets an inside look at the glamour of Hollywood. Frank Sinatra would be over for dinner, or Bob Hope and Milton Berle and all these people. But hanging out with Hollywood royalty isn't a career. And after high school in 1960, Barry realizes he has no idea what he wants to do with his life. I knew I didn't want to go to college. And then it was, well, what the hell are you going to do? And so I did nothing for about a year. I basically stayed out kind of all night and slept most of the day and would pass my father in the hallways who wouldn't speak to me. Eventually, Diller realizes his bohemian existence can't last forever. He evaluates potential careers, but only one option seems viable. I know where my instincts are. My instincts were about entertainment, the world of entertainment. It clicked on me that I could maybe go to William Morris. In the 1960s, the William Morris Talent Agency is one of the most powerful companies in the industry. Their client list is a veritable who's who of Hollywood icons. And as luck would have it, Diller's surrogate father is one of them. Superstar Danny Thomas is playing at the Sands Hotel on the Las Vegas Strip when Barry decides to call in a favor. Dad told me that Barry called him, and my father was more than happy to help Barry. Diller is ushered into William Morris's mail room, a proving ground for up-and-coming industry power brokers. David Geffen worked there, and Michael Ovitz, who went on to the, achieve their own level of success later on. Uh, they were all started in the, in the mail room at uh, William Morris. It was definitely the lowest rung on the ladder, but that's where they had to start. But Diller couldn't care less about climbing the agency's corporate ranks. I had no interest in being an agent. I had no interest in anything other than sucking up literally from A to Z, the file room. For a young man hell-bent on breaking into the industry, the file room is a sort of heaven, the collected knowledge of the agency client memos, scripts, movie contracts, and more, all at his disposal. For more than four years, Diller soaks it all in, and soon enough, he's amassed an encyclopedic knowledge of the business of Hollywood. But now he needs to put it to work. Once again, the Thomas family plays a key role. Well, I was dating Len Goldberg, and uh, I introduced them at my house, and uh, Len liked him right away, and I had said to Lenny, I think Barry would be a great assistant for you. It's the mid-60s, and Leonard Goldberg is a mid-level vice president at TV's newest network, ABC. Goldberg wants to see what Diller is made of, so he goads him into an argument about agency's high commission rates. He was really needling him about it, and Barry completely defended the agency's uh, position. I remember later that night, Lenny said to me, I really respected him for that. He's a loyal guy. Goldberg offers Diller a job as his assistant. I said yes to that because I thought, well, yeah, I, I, I like television. I want to learn more about television. And I certainly, I mean, they're going to throw me out of this mailroom pretty soon. I got to go someplace. It's a fortuitous decision. Almost as soon as the 24-year-old accepts Goldberg's offer, there's a major shakeup in the executive ranks at ABC. They picked my guy, Leonard Goldberg, to be the head of programming. So instead of being the assistant to the junior person, I became assistant to the head of programming. Luck? Fate? Whatever you call it, Ditter feels his instant advancement at ABC is indicative of his entire career. That's kind of my first experience at uh, uh, the power of serendipity. It has been, if you would call it a lodestar, it's the thing I most trust and most believe in. In the mid-60s, ABC is dead last in the ratings. So although this position is a golden opportunity for Diller, the network itself leaves much to be desired. But was always a distant third to NBC and CBS. ABC was fourth among three. Coming up next on Titans, Barry Diller climbs the ranks at ABC. And it's up to him and other young Turks to turn the number three network into a programming powerhouse. We had a great spirit, and we were the comeback kids, and it was a pretty wild time. And later, can a TV guy conquer the silver screen? Television people were 
way in the back of the car. And they treated me at the beginning, I mean, really quite horribly. New York City, 1966. 24 year old Barry Diller has quit his post at the William Morris Talent Agency and signed on at the floundering network ABC. And he moves from sunny California to the gritty streets of Manhattan. It's an exhilarating but jarring move. I had the worst stomach ache. I'd grown up in this place where everything is green and leafy, and there I was on cold concrete, and it was March, and my ears hurt because I'd never really been in the cold. But as Diller settles into his new job, his West Coast roots prove indispensable, and he starts putting his enviable Rolodex to good work. One of Barry's first big responsibilities was selling that girl to uh, ABC Daytime. Diller's old friend stars in her breakout role as aspiring actress Anne Marie. He was very excited about that, that uh, he made the deal with William Morris Agency of all places. Instantly, that girl is a ratings gold mine. Diller is also charged with hiring a new assistant for Goldberg. I introduced myself, hello, I'm Michael Eisner, I'm here to see Leonard Goldberg. And a man comes out and uh, ushers me back and interviews me and he never said he wasn't Leonard Goldberg and so I did my whole interview with Barry Diller. So that's how I met. Eisner lands the gig at ABC and the two future media moguls begin a lifelong friendship. You know, we got along very well. I was one that always stood up to him and so I think he respected that. Diller and Eisner will eventually head up some of Hollywood's most profitable companies. But for now, they're rank and file employees working their way up the corporate ladder. And ABC seems to be the perfect place to do it. If you wanted to take responsibility, there was nobody and nothing really to stop you at ABC. In short order, Diller will take the reins of one of the network's most important tasks. Every network had at least one movie night. So I was actually buying movies, theatrical movies. And because these movie sales were so important to these companies, they were essentially handled by the people who ran those companies. In the late 1960s, Charlie Bluthorn is running Paramount Pictures. He had personally negotiated a deal to sell ABC the rights to a series of Paramount films. But once Diller gets wind of the deal, he discovers that the terms are less than favorable to ABC. I call up Mr. Blue Dorn and I say, I know you had this meeting, and I know you think that you sold all these movies, but I'm here to tell you, you didn't. Blue Dorn is stunned but impressed as young Diller flexes his negotiating skills and wins a better deal for ABC. It's an exchange the Paramount chief won't soon forget. ABC brass reward Diller with a promotion, and suddenly, his star is on the rise. He was very young, negotiating with chairman of motion picture companies to buy movies. He was a big deal. At the time, the average cost for a network to license the rights to a studio film is $400,000. Diller believes that ABC can just as easily produce the films themselves, and for a lot less money. His idea was, what if you constructed an entire movie night of nothing but made-for-TV movies and build it as such so that viewers could come to expect a premiere every week. Diller estimates he can save ABC about $50,000 per film. He convinces his network bosses to take a chance on the ABC Movie of the Week. The Movie of the Week. To keep costs down, they tap young talent like Steven Spielberg, who makes his first feature film, Duel, for them. We decided that every movie had to be sold in a good one sentence, so that it would look great in TV Guide. Many of the films broached topics deemed taboo for network TV. We made the first movie about the Vietnam War. We made the first movie about homosexuality called That Certain Summer, which won the Peabody Award. We made a film called Brian's Song, which is maybe one of the best movies of any kind. The movie of the week saves the network millions of dollars and teaches Diller how to make quality films on a budget. Movie studios at the time were making 10 movies a year. We were making 50. It was a fantastic experience for me and fun. 
But it's not just in movies that Diller is proving his mettle. Along with Eisner, he is responsible for creating original series as well. We were the hip shooting network. They would try almost anything. Programs like Bewitched and The Mod Squad are already hits. Then Barry and his cohorts capture lightning in a bottle with Happy Days, which will go on to become one of the top-rated series of all time. ABC moved from the back of the pack to the number one network by the, by the mid-1970s. Uh, As ABC's ratings climb, so does Diller's reputation. But it's not all work and no play. I was in my 20s. It was okay to stay up till three or four at night, somehow get up at eight. I wasn't monkish or in any kind of uh, denial of life. But despite being the center of a wild and high-powered social scene, a lack of a formal education leaves him playing catch-up in some situations. One day, Michael Eisner mentions to Diller that Edith Wharton is his favorite author. And I met him at the elevator maybe a day later, and uh, he had six at least books that he was holding. And I looked at them, and every one was Edith Wharton. You could not tell him something that he didn't know about, that he didn't learn about in the next week or so. While Diller is basking in this success at ABC, Paramount Pictures comes courting. Its owner, Charlie Bluthorn, distinctly remembers Diller's fierce negotiating style. One day, he calls me up and says, all right, I'm going to make you chairman of Paramount. It may well be the opportunity of a lifetime, but Diller needs convincing. I was not, I was not in the movie business. I was in my little television movie business, but that's a whole different world from, you know, big lights and cameras. My first reaction was no. It sounds crazy to me even now. But I reluctantly said yes, with lots of misgivings. Coming up next on Titans, Diller takes the helm as chairman of Paramount Pictures. But the 32-year-old isn't sure he's up to the task. It was such a train wreck that then I thought, oh God, I'm really going to fail. Now I'm really going to fail big. Los Angeles, 1974. After an eight-year absence, native son Barry Diller returns home, this time as the chairman of Paramount Pictures. But Diller meets immediate opposition. Few at Paramount believe a TV guy can run the show. It certainly was a time when people in the movie business kind of peed on the people in the television business. And they treated me at the beginning, I mean, really quite horribly. Diller's boss, Charlie Bluthorn, CEO of Paramount's parent company, Gulf & Western, makes it clear that Diller has his support. Bluthorn regarded Diller as a son in, in many ways. As long as he was turning a profit on Paramount, which he was hired to do, Bluthorn would leave him alone. The projects that Diller inherits are problematic, and the development slate isn't much better. The first two years at Paramount were a definition of failing upward. I mean, the movies, I mean, they were really not very good movies. As the pre-Diller projects clear out, the new chairman starts to bring his own vision to the screen. That's where I began making really fast and furious decisions. I mean, every minute was a different decision about something. One of them is to hire Michael Eisner, his old friend and colleague from ABC, as president of Paramount. He was frustrated by the, the old movie system. It was just a, a business that didn't have the discipline of what we had learned at the movie of the week in television. The keys to their success are budget discipline and a keen eye for scripts. Very rarely does a lousy script turn out great. That's almost impossible. To him, nothing was good enough. And to me, it was, well, then, Barry, what do we... Then we have no movies. So it was always a compromise. Diller has an intense management style. He demands near perfection from his employees. I learned very quickly in a meeting with Barry Diller that whatever you want to say to him, put it right up front in your first sentence. He's that impatient. And he invites confrontation. I've always believed that that's what you do to get good work creatively is you have to have tension and it has to be arguing your passion. 
Finally, in 1977, after three years of bona fide bombs from Paramount, there is a glimmer of hope. Then we released a movie called Looking for Mr. Goodbar. It wasn't a huge hit, but it was different. It was different than what everybody else was doing. And it resonated a little and gave us a little confidence. That little bit of confidence starts arguably the greatest run that one executive has ever had in the modern studio era. Some of the hits include Saturday Night Fever, An Officer and a Gentleman, Airplane, Urban Cowboy, Beverly Hills Cop. And we went from last place to first place in like six months. I mean, we really did have a, a great movie company. We passed on a lot of stuff, and very rarely did we pass on stuff that, that we were sorry about. And the one we went forward with, which was agony at that time, because it was could have been expensive, was Raiders of the Lost Ark. We kept it under $18 million budget. I can still tell you all the budgets, <laughs> and so can he. Believe me, so can he. Raiders of the Lost Ark goes on to gross more than $350 million and launches one of the most beloved series in the history of cinema. As Paramount speeds ahead of the competition, Diller keeps his foot on the accelerator. He always did everything hard. He, he worked hard, he played hard. He, everything was a little bit over the top. Diller is a fixture on the wild social scene of the 1970s. He's seen with Calvin Klein, Al Pacino, Warren Beatty, Robert Redford, Deborah Winger. Soon another name is added to that exclusive list. Diller attends a party at a friend's house and is entranced by the dynamic fashion designer Dion von Furstenberg. And the next day he called me and then he called me again and he called me again. Then he asked me on a date. We've all had uh, first loves. Uh, this was my first, second, and third love. At first I thought, oh, he would be a great person to have as a friend. And, uh, but then it turned out to be much more than a friend. It became very passionate. They are together constantly, but von Furstenberg isn't ready to commit. But even when we were apart, we were always connected. At the studio, Diller continues to burnish his TV cred as a major supplier of groundbreaking programming. On Diller's watch, Paramount Television produces Laverne and Shirley, Taxi, and Cheers. Barry has very good taste. He understands content, he understands commercial, and he is a businessman. It is rare to find that in one person. If you can hold on to the rug, from people who are trying to pull it from you and keep course correcting uh, as you go, you really do have a chance to come through. Diller's success gives him room to push a bold idea. He wants to launch a fourth broadcast network and he wants Paramount's parent company to bankroll it. And along came, I think it was 82 or 83, some terrible economic turndown, and Gulf and Western wouldn't give us the money. Even though this project derails, Paramount Pictures is the top-grossing movie and television production studio, with annual profits topping $100 million in 1983. So it was his second major success, uh, turning that into a, a, an entertainment powerhouse again. Diller had risen to become the, uh, uh, the highest paid executive in the United States with an annual, total annual income of $2.1 million dollars. This is an era when the average compensation for top executives is slightly more than four hundred thousand dollars. Then, in February 1983, tragedy strikes. Got this call at five in the morning. I'm sure everybody knows. Calls at odd hours or not good. Gulf and Western Chief Charlie Bluthorn, who has been Diller's boss and endless supporter, has succumbed to an aggressive cancer. Up until now, Diller has operated with relative autonomy, but soon he'll have to report to a new boss. Trouble is, that new boss, Marty Davis, is one of the paramount executives Diller detests. I couldn't bear him, and I couldn't bear the management style that he had. I just couldn't bear it. And so I thought, uh, well, what am I going to do here? And, Again, serendipity. 
I'm literally in an elevator thinking, well, you know, Fox is a mess. You know, maybe I could go do that. Coming up next on Titans, Barry Diller gives a little boy permission to tell America to eat his shorts. Los Angeles, California, 1984. The recent management shakeup at Paramount Pictures has left chairman Barry Diller vulnerable. Diller fears he'll clash with new company brass, so he weighs his options. Across town, 20th Century Fox is struggling, and Diller sees an opportunity. He begins secret talks with owner Marvin Davis. Marvin Davis was out of the Texas oil patch. His game was to buy companies, spin them off for a profit, buy new companies, spin them off, and just keep the game going. Although Davis owns Fox, he has no experience running a studio. He needs a seasoned executive. When the industry heard that Diller was teaming up with Marvin Davis, they called it the Hitler-Stalin Pact. They said, these two guys are never going to get along. I said to Marvin Davis, look, I, I, I'm, I don't know you, so the agreement we have to have is on paper, by contract, I only have to talk to you once a year when we set a budget, and you cannot talk to anyone in the company. And Diller manages to wrangle a compensation package that includes 25% of any increase in the company's equity value. Diller soon learns why Davis is so willing to accept his seemingly egregious terms. Fox is $430 million in debt. He was such a great con man. And then it occurred to me, oh my God, I can't quit. I'm three weeks into this job. How could I quit? I thought, oh, I am stuck. But Diller doesn't stay stuck for long. He maneuvers Davis into putting the company up for sale. But it's a gamble. Diller has no idea who the buyer will be. Soon enough, a certain newspaper mogul comes calling. When we had the chance to buy Fox, it was a piece of great luck. Barry was there running it. Rupert Murdoch, the socially conservative Australian, and Diller, the quintessential Hollywood liberal, make an odd pair. But the two agree that the most important thing is turning a profit. Rupert Murdoch sized up the situation very shrewdly. He said, I can get along with him, I respect him, I can get along with him. With Murdoch behind him, Diller gears up to steer Fox back into the black. Then, another stroke of luck. Diller learns that a group of TV stations is up for sale. The stations provide an opportunity to complete the audacious plan he first hatched at Paramount. I've always had this idea. I think three networks is not enough. The Fox Broadcasting Corporation is moving full steam ahead with plans to become a major TV network. A fourth network. Today, he and a partner agreed to buy seven American television stations. The stations are in New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Washington, Dallas, Boston, and Chicago. We were for it immediately. Perhaps without thinking enough about the price, but we were for it. Murdoch pays more than $2 billion for seven stations across the nation laying the groundwork for the Fox network. But in order to make Fox a true broadcast network, it needs programming. Their first effort is a late night talk show to go head to head with Johnny Carson. The Late Show starring Joan Rivers is supposed to make a splash when it debuts on October 9th, 1986. But the show is a bust and is canceled after only seven months. Still, Diller is not discouraged. Everything me is about again one dumb step and it's about uh, course correcting uh, bouncing off walls and figuring out what's the right path without Barry I wouldn't have had the ability to do it or known where to go for the people and he was very much the founder of it in April 1987 Fox debuts network programming on Friday Saturday and Sunday nights some of the programs show promise, like The Tracy Ullman Show and 21 Jump Street. But then one show breaks out. I wanted to call it Not the Cosbys, because at that time the most successful show on television was The Bill Cosby Show. This was the anti-family. Married with Children puts Diller's new network on the map. 
Fox has found its voice. Once we found the vein, we were off. It's a different kind of network, which is this edgy, willing to take risks, willing to be a little sexy and, and a little more violent than the others, just staying short of getting shut down because of it. We thought that the youth market was a big opportunity, and then we got bolder and bolder as we went along. Fox's next mega hit debuts two years later. Other shows like Cops push legal and ethical boundaries. The lawyers just ran around waving their hands and saying, no, no, you can't do it. Um, and of course, that's exactly the thing that, that gets Barry Diller interested when somebody says you can't do it. The Fox network has launched. And Barry Diller is earning more than $10 million a year. But despite his power and wealth, he is still just Murdoch's employee. It occurred to me one day, you know what? It's not mine. And I act like it's mine. I function out of the thing that it's mine. But it's not. It's his. In February 1992, Diller abruptly quits Fox. It's time, he feels, to build his own empire. I was a little shocked. But he wanted to go and do his own thing. Barry was always a person who had never been really uh, greedy for money, but he wanted to show that he could you know, be his own boss totally. True to form, Diller professes no clue as to what his next move will be. You either are the thing you say you want to be or you're not. You either are or you're not. It kept resonating in my head. Titans. Barry Diller sets out to chart his own course and winds up on the selling floor. Thanks for shopping, QVC. By the early 1990s, Barry Diller has reached the summit of the entertainment industry. He has been a programming executive at ABC the chairman of Paramount Pictures and a co-founder of the Fox Network. He had resigned from Fox and he didn't know what he wanted to do. And then I discovered QVC. This is Gail in Savannah, Georgia. Hi, Gail. Von Furstenberg is intrigued. She convinces her longtime friend, Barry Diller, to visit the company's Westchester, Pennsylvania headquarters. So I went to this place called QVC in the wilds of Pennsylvania and I see something I'd never seen before. Here there was a screen and they were selling things. And people on the other side of the screen were buying them. They were interacting. Thanks for calling QVC. It's available in red. It was not a passive storytelling experience. It was a whole other thing. In 1992, shopping network QVC is one of the fastest growing companies in the country. From its interactive studio, designers hawk their wares to an audience of television viewers from coast to coast. Do you have the item number? Right. I saw at QVC this primitive convergence of television sets and computers. I just said, I've never seen this stuff used in relationship to each other before. Thanks for shopping, QVC. And I was fascinated. Several months later, Diller is having lunch with Brian and Ralph Roberts, who are on the board of QVC. In conversation, Ralph Roberts mentions that QVC's founder, Joseph Siegel, is thinking of retiring. Diller asks if Siegel would be willing to sell his shares. I said, do you think I could buy his stake? He said, I don't know, I'll ask. Uh, would you, uh, why would you want to do that? And I said, well, I don't know why, but I want to. <laughs> they were utterly perplexed. The lunch ends, I walk out, I get into the car, and I say, I know what I'm going to do. Diller purchases a $25 million stake in QVC and becomes its CEO. Diller goes out and astounds everybody by buying QVC. People said, has, has he lost his mind? It's QVC's a downscale shopping station on cable selling Zircon rings. That's not Barry Diller. What is he up to? What is Diller up to buying QVC? And everybody really did think I'd gone mad. 
His New York friends all kind of looked down upon and said, what are we doing? Barry Diller, who's ran studios and networks, is going to be running QVC and taking calls over the phone. I mean, they're all kind of puzzled by that. Cable TV giant John Malone is another part owner of QVC. The stock actually performed quite well, literally within days of Barry's announcing he's joining. So it gave quite a boost to the business and brought some credibility. And Diller gets the last laugh. Over the first year, QVC revenues increase 14%. But Diller isn't solely interested in QVC. He wants to build a media empire, and he sets his sights on his old stomping grounds, Paramount Pictures, which has just gone up for sale. We were surprised when we found that Barry was going after uh, Paramount. And everybody said, well, it's just a vendetta. Uh, Barry's trying to get even with Martin Davis, whom he couldn't stand. And Davis isn't too keen on Diller taking over. He would prefer to merge the company with Sumner Redstone's Viacom. In the end, it's up to Diller to sweeten his own $10 billion offer. It's a painful decision, and one that he knows will shape his legacy. But to Diller, the economics just don't add up. And Barry says, I, I can't justify it. This is that tough businessman side of him. I don't think I can pay that price. I lost it. Well, I lost it because I wouldn't make the final bid, but I chose to say that we lost. I don't think Barry Diller came out of that experience with negative PR. I think he was, he was viewed as a, as a guy who made an interesting bid, knew when to get out, um, and, and when the press came to Barry Diller, he said, they won, we lost, next. And he just moved on. He looked back. Coming up next on Titans, an old school media mogul reinvents himself as a new media guru and takes the internet by storm. Barry says, you know, this whole computer, internet, digital thing looks to me like it's going to be a big deal. It's the mid-1990s, and having recently sold his stake in QVC, Barry Diller is a media mogul without a company. So what's next? Tomorrow. <laughs> but Barry hasn't given up on the brand of interactive commerce he witnessed at QVC. In fact, he's so confident that he decides to purchase QVC's primary rival, the Home Shopping Network. Hey, people in Hollywood who thought I had gone insane the first time around, now they said, he's totally lost his mind. But Diller is forming a plan that, if successful, will steer his career in a completely new direction. Part of his success has been knowing when to move away from something. So he was willing to move away from the safe world into something that was riskier. That's very unusual um, for executives. It's 1995, and the Internet is just beginning to take hold of the public consciousness. Electronic commerce. It's a concept that has intrigued Barry Diller ever since his first visit to QVC. Diller reworks his company into IAC Interactive Corporation and quickly goes on a spending spree. We started buying companies that we thought were going to make the transition from offline to online. He's putting together the basis, the foundation for his modern empire. Soon, IAC owns a mind-boggling array of internet assets. By 2008, Diller has built IAC into an $18 billion company. For a former studio exec, it's quite the accomplishment. It's a combination of street smart shrewdness and, and really genius and, and a visionary look at the, at the future and, and how this whole media uh, world that we live in today has, was going to shape up. He saw it 18 years ago. In 2001, Diller takes another step into uncharted territory, this time in his personal life. I mean, I have a complicated history with sexual issues. 
although we had a long separation period. Since 1975, with that exception, we've been together. Finally, Dion gives him something he wants very badly. It was his 59th birthday, and I didn't know what to give him for his birthday, and so I said, OK, I'll marry you for your birthday. On February 2nd, Barry and Dion tie the knot at City Hall. Over the next decade, Barry Diller becomes one of America's highest paid executives. Between 2000 and 2010, he rakes in upwards of $1.1 billion in salary, bonuses, and stock options. For Barry, money is a consequence of good work. Barry has never really been interested in, in piling money. But Diller's formidable earnings draw ire from some IAC investors. IAC is not the gangbuster digital company that, that the Googles were and the Facebooks are with explosive growth. And if your growth has been slow and you're taking your compensation is rich, people start saying, oh, wait a second, why are you doing that? And he has to come up with answers to that. Diller has defended his earnings by highlighting the company's positive, albeit modest, returns to shareholders. But some investors and analysts have major concerns about IAC's prospects. So they made some wrong bets. I mean, Google has 65% market share of search. Uh, you know, Barry has a search engine, but when was the last time he used it? But he has nice businesses like Expedia, like Match.com, that do nicely. Still, Diller continues to impress his contemporaries. With his broad success in nearly every corner of the media landscape. There's enormous respect in the industry for Barry Diller. He's always curious about new ideas, what's around the corner. You know, I would still invest with Barry in almost anything he wanted to go take on. His entrepreneurism is what's taken him through. And that is what America needs. In 2010, Diller steps away from his day-to-day -day oversight of IAC. True to form, he leaves onlookers guessing at his next big move. So they start wondering, does he have a next act? And if you look based on his performance in the past, Barry Diller's had a lot of second and third and fourth acts. And so I wouldn't write him off. I will get back to doing what I did in the earlier period see what kind of new opportunities can crack myself open and see what comes of it so that's where I'll spend more of my time I'm excited about that